thanks for the uh, introduction. Uh, all right, so I'm Spike. I, like, like you said, I work at Airbnb based out of San Francisco. Uh, I've been there for three years writing JavaScript and Ruby. And I just want to say I'm super stoked to be here, really proud. Uh, this is such a great event, the best tech event I've ever been to, and just really happy to be a part of it. So let's get started. We're going to talk about isomorphic JavaScript. And so probably, if I were you, the first thing I'd be thinking is, WTF is isomorphic JavaScript. What is this big, fancy sounding word? Well, it's simple, really. The way I see it, it's just JavaScript code that can be shared between different environments. So I'm mostly interested in the client and the server. I'm a web engineer, so sharing code between the web browser and something like Node.js. But as we've seen in the last few days, there's a million different uh, JavaScript environments these days, JavaScript runtimes. So you can imagine also something like uh, Narwhal, sharing code with Narwhal. You guys have heard of Narwhal. It's the new Java 8 uh, JavaScript runtime. It's a successor to Rhino. Just to note, there's not an actually an official Narwhal logo, so I thought that was appropriate. Uh, also, native platforms, so Android, iOS, these can run JavaScript pretty well these days, and so you can imagine wanting to share code between your web app or your server and native platforms. But also, things like Spark and Tessel, these are, uh, we've, we've heard about these in the last few days, little devices that can run JavaScript. Why, why can't we share a piece of code with those two? And if you want to get really crazy and futuristic, you can share code with your cars. So I don't know if anyone's heard of the QNK specification. Uh, I learned about this a couple months ago. There's actually, the, the automotive industry is coming up with a spec to use web technologies to build displays in cars. So like your driving directions, uh, your radio, air conditioning, all that. So, but really, today we're just going to focus on client and server. So a, a really high level kind of overview of how I imagine this works is you've got some code that runs in the client side. You've got some code that runs in your back end. And there's some layer that's shared between the client and the server. So there's certain things that would only exist in the client side, certain you know, user interactions, logging, whatever. Uh, and your back end could be Node, but it could be Ruby or Python or, or you know, PHP, whatever. The, the idea is it's just a persistence layer in an API. And then there's this shared layer in between, which can be run on both sides. And this could be views, so templates or components or view logic, whatever. It could be application logic, so models or whatever arbitrary logic. And um, it could be routes, for example. Oh, by the way, the timer hasn't started, so I'm just going to keep going forever. Uh, uh, so let's talk about briefly the etymology of the term isomorphic JavaScript. So uh, just to be really pedantic, here's the dictionary definition of isomorphic. Corresponding or similar in form and relations. Right? That makes sense. Uh, so if we look at the Latin forms to be further pedantic, Iso means same, and morph means form, so same form, so code that can share a form between these different environments. But really, we've got to give credit to Charlie Robbins for popularizing this. Uh, is the first time I ever heard of isomorphic JavaScript was in his blog post, Scaling Isomorphic JavaScript Code, back in 2011. So Charlie is uh, index zero on Twitter. He's one of the founders of Nojitsu. And he's, he's got a great blog post kind of describing the different MVC versus MVVM versus MVP uh, patterns and how it could apply to isomorphic code. But when I, when I first started talking about isomorphic JavaScript, I released a blog post uh, last year. And on Hacker News, most people were saying, you're using it wrong. Like, isomorphic comes from mathematics, or it's, it's a chemistry term, or it's this or that. And they're saying, really what you mean is monomorphic. Or actually, heteromorphic is more appropriate for what you're describing. Or homomorphic is, is more correct. Or polymorphic. And I'm going to say, I don't like, whatever, it's a word. Um, you can refer all questions to Charlie Robbins. Um, there's some more playful trolling as well. I don't know if you know D. Shaw. He might be in the audience today. But uh, he, he likes to make fun of you whenever I use that term. He calls it a $5 word. And every time I say it, he finds me $5 in virtual currency. <laughs> and so by the end of today, I'm going to owe him a couple thousand dollars. So just as an introduction, let's, let's look at some apps that are using uh, this approach today. And then we'll dive into how you can build isomorphic apps. So a great example is Flickr. I don't know if you've seen the Flickr redesign recently after they were bought by Yahoo. Uh, but this, their photo page, so this is like you, know, you, you search for silly cat, and you get this, this list page. And then you click on one of, 
one of these, and it's re-rendered in the client side, right? It's like a single page app, client side app, whatever, re-renders. But the, the cool part is, if you were to refresh either this page or the previous page, it would all come rendered from the server. So each page can be rendered fully on the server, or can be rendered in the client side. And Flickr does this using Yahoo's MoDown libraries. I think there's some MoDown developers in the audience uh, from Yahoo, but basically it's a, a collection of loosely coupled modules kind of based around Express that lets you build apps like this. And it's a successor to Mojito. Mojito was Yahoo's really ambitious, large project that, that attempted to build uh, isomorphic apps. It's something that they used internally for a few years ago, but it never really caught on more broadly because it's so monolithic and it's very YUI-ish. So Instagram is another cool example. Uh, you might not have realized this, but Instagram.com is all built using React. And if you land on someone's Instagram page, it, it would be rendered on the server side. You click on a photo, it would be re-rendered client side. You refresh, rendered server side, same thing. Um, and so this was built using Facebook's React library. As someone mentioned earlier today, React can be executed both on the client and the server. On the server, it emits HTML. On the, on the client, it emits DOM nodes. But what's really interesting about this case is Instagram.com is a Django app. So it's written in Python. And they used a node service running on the web, on the Python box. And you would hand it a template and some data, and it would come back at you with some HTML. But there's an asterisk here, because Instagram Dot com no longer uses this. They disabled the node process. From what I understand, it's because they, uh, there were a bunch of Python developers didn't want the overhead of maintaining the node service. But uh, it's possible. Another example, I have to plug Airbnb. This is our mobile website, m.airbnb.com. Same story, server rendered, but it's also a, a single page app. So as you navigate around, it's re-rendered re client side. And so we developed a, a library called Render based off of this experience. And Render lets you take a backbone app and pull it down to the server side and run your, your models and your views and your templates on the server using Express, but it's also a full client side app. And one of my favorite examples is Asana. Have, has anyone heard of Asana? It's a really awesome task management, uh, project management app, and it's all real time and super advanced and stuff. But what's really special about Asana is it, it takes a different approach than these other things that we've seen. The entire application runtime is synced between the client and the server. So they've spent a couple of years in R&D on this. And what they came up with was a system whereby every single user session has a corresponding JavaScript process on the server, a dedicated process on the server for every user session. And as the user navigates around in the app, those, those actions are synchronized to the server side. And the server side will compute all the same stuff. It'll execute the views, and it'll fetch data, and, and do all the same stuff. It throws away the HTML. What it wants is the state. So they have got, they've got a full picture of the application state on the server side as it exists on the client side. And it enables some cool stuff. Now, this took them a few years. We can't all do this because uh, we're not all founded by the youngest billionaire in the world. Asana was founded by one of the Facebook co-founders. And so they, they had a bit of a runway to work with. Uh, but for the rest of us, we can use Meteor. So uh, in many ways, I see Meteor as a kind of an open source take on what Asana's building. And uh, from what I understand, a few of their engineers used to work at Asana, and they brought over some of the concepts. But I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard about Meteor by now. But it's a real-time app framework. And it does some really cool stuff with sharing code between client and server. So why would you go to the trouble of doing this? There is some trouble. You've got to jump through some hoops to share your code properly. So the first thing for me, in my opinion, would be performance. And this applies mostly to the cases like Flickr, where you're rendering the whole page on the server side, even though it's a single page app. Now, that, that comes from the, the initial page load speed is so much faster, and it feels so much faster, because you're not waiting on all the assets to download and fetch and initialize and, and fetch data before you render the page. And you might remember that Twitter used to be client-side rendered, right? There's a hash bang in the URL. And a couple years ago, they switched back to server-side rendering. And they said they saw a five times improvement in perceived performance. So that's, that's great. Another reason could be SEO. So many of us, I'm sure, have built a single page app just to be told that it needs, needs to be crawlable by a web crawler. And if, by default, your entire app can be rendered on both sides, it's not really a concern. 
There's an asterisk here because you may have seen last week Google wrote a public blog post saying that actually their web crawler has the capability to execute JavaScript. It's a headless browser. We've kind of known this for a while, but they've, they've, they're explicit about it now. Um, so it's, this is less of an issue, but I'm sure there's still a long tail of, of crawlers that don't have that capability. Flexibility is another one. Because you can run your code on either sides, it opens up a lot of doors for doing new things. And I think that Meteor and Asana wouldn't have been possible if it weren't for this ability. And maintainability. I think a lot of us have uh, tried to share templates between client and server, for example, in different languages, say in Ruby or in Python, but you end up duplicating either part of the template or the template engine or your view helpers, or s at some point you're duplicating code, and that's never a good thing. So there's a number of use cases for why you might want to use isomorphic code. The first would be templating. I think uh, a lot of us, when we first explore this, we, we look at templating. We look at sharing our code between the client and the server. And so I think of templating as the gateway drug to isomorphic JavaScript, because uh, you start with sharing a handlebars template or a mustache template or whatever, uh, but pretty soon, everything that goes into populating those templates needs to be shared. So things like internationalization, you need to translate strings on the client and on the server. Date and currency formatting. At Airbnb, we had a bunch of handlebars helpers that help us do stuff like this. And once you try to share that, you, you, know, you, need to, you want to be able to render that on both sides too. Arbitrary application logic. That's, it could be anything, right? It could be model logic or any sort of application logic. Routing. Once you start sharing your view layer between the client and the server, you don't want to have to duplicate your routes between, say, Backbone Router and your Rails app, right? You want to have a single set of, a single source of truth for your, your routes. Model validation. How many of us have written form validation in the client side so it, there was instantaneous uh, you know, feedback, good user experience, but then duplicated some sort of like form val or model validation in your API. I think that's pretty common. API interactions. A lot of times we want to make calls to an API, either a first party or a third party API using HTTP or some other transport. And we might need to make that call on the client for whatever reason. We might need to make that call on the server. But if it's all in the same language and we can share that, then there's only there's a, single, uh, a single set of semantics for doing that. And then anything else, I mean, whatever you can imagine, whatever is necessary for your app, your use case, potentially you could share some code between the client and the server. So it's important to note that isomorphic JavaScript is a spectrum. There's no one way to do it. There's, there's a, a lot of different approaches. So if this is our spectrum, if the blue side is like the, the side where you share just a few bits of view layer or a little bit of logic and the pink side is the entire view layer is shared, right? Your entire application is shared. Your app can kind of fall anywhere along the spectrum depending on your use case and your ambition. And so for, for this side, you don't really need a lot of abstractions if you're just sharing like some templates or something. It's pretty straightforward to do that. But the further you go along that spectrum, you need to build more abstractions. Because the client and the server are very different environments, you need to abstract away those differences, whether it's like accessing cookies or, or anything. And, and we'll, we'll get into that a bit more. And so for some examples, Instagram.com would be, would be on this side of the spectrum, where they just shared their view layer. They had a totally different server-side technology for their, most of their app. Whereas Asana is like all the way, that's like the extreme, where the entire application is, is shared. I also see two categories for isomorphic JavaScript code. It could be environment agnostic, or it can be shimmed per environment. So environment agnostic code does not depend on any browser-specific properties, like the window, or any server-specific properties, like the process, or request, or response, stuff like that. And an easy example would be handlebars, or probably any templating library. 
It's just dealing with primitives, strings, arrays, objects, functions. So there's no reason this shouldn't be able to be executed in any, any environment that's like a, a proper JavaScript runtime. So here we're creating a template, which is a string, compiling it to a function, and executing the function, getting back the rendered HTML. So the other category, and the more interesting category, is shimmed per environment. So these libraries provide shims for accessing environment-specific properties. So your module can expose a single API for use on both sides. So this could be, let, let's say you're, you're writing like a routing library. In the client side, if you want to see what the current page URL is, you would do something like window.location.pathname. And on the server side, you'd have to access the request, request.path, or, or this is an, uh, what you would do in, in Express. And a great example of a library like this would be SuperAgent. So SuperAgent is an HTTP client library. It lets you make HTTP requests. And in this example, we're saying superagent.get, so it's a get request to some JSON endpoint, and .end, and we pass in a callback, and the callback takes the response. And the response has properties like the status code, HTTP headers, the body, all this stuff. And it's great to be able to use the same API on the client and the server. So how many times, I mean, I, typically we use like jQuery.ajax uh, for our Ajax needs in the client side. And then on the server, we'd use HTTP module or the request module or, or whatever. And so this is a great example of, of, of a module that's shimmed per environment. And it actually provides, diff, under the hood, different implementations for the two different environments. But it exposes a single API to the developer. So there's a few abstractions that I'll mention. A simple one would be the user agent. So let's say you're doing something, you're writing like some mobile web app or something, and you need to determine what platform the user is on. On the client side, you'd say navigator.useragent. On the server, you actually have to look at the HTTP header, the, the user agent header that's attached to the request. Cookies is a great example. If you're trying to set a cookie in the web browser, you just say document.cookie equals, and then some string, some specially formatted string. On the server side, you gotta set a header, set an HTTP header, and the header name is set cookie. So you would say response.set header, set cookie, and then the cookie string. And you, you can imagine why we'd wanna do this on both sides. Like a lot of times, you need to set a cookie on the client side in response to some user interaction, and we're constantly setting cookies on the server side. Redirects is another example. So if you're doing a, a full page redirect in the browser, you'd say document.location.href equals, uh, th and then the URL. Or if it's a push date application, you might use the HTML5 history API and say window.push state, some arguments, and then the URL. But on the server side, we need to do a full HTTP redirect, response.redirect. And, and there's an additional complication in that on the server, there's there's different HTTP status codes, right? So there could be a 301 redirect or a 302 redirect. And so if you're trying to build a, a, an abstraction around a redirect in your app, you need to accommodate for those differences. So let, let's get to the fun part. How to isomorph, how you can build isomorphic JavaScript today. Um, so what we're gonna do together is we're gonna write a module that, that solves the cookie case, that abstracts out the setting of cookies and provides the same API on the client and the server. So we want to make an API that looks like this. Set cookie, the cookie name, the cookie value, that's it. Super simple. So as we mentioned before, this would turn into, in the browser, it would turn into document.cookie equals my, my serialized cookie string. And on the server, it, it would be, uh, uh, we'd be setting a, an HTTP header, response.set header, set cookie, and then this, that same exact serialized string. But it gets more complicated. 
cookies have additional options. There's a path, you can set a domain, you can set an ex expiry header or um, expiry property. And so then the cookie string can look something like this, document.cookie equals my cookie, the value, you know, all this stuff. And when I see that, you know what I think? I think, ew, like, I don't want to do that. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of edge cases there probably. It's probably years of RFCs to, to weed through and try to, to do that right. So luckily, there's a module that does this for us already. The cookie module on NPM is used by Express and Connect and 108 other libraries according to NPM. So let's just use this because someone's already written it. So NPM and Browserify to the rescue. We've heard a, a bit today about how awesome it is to use Browserify and NPM in your front-end code, and we're going we're to continue along that, uh, along that theme. So Browserify lets you use CommonJS to require your modules in the browser. But more interestingly, it lets you package up your dependencies from your node modules directory. So we can NPM install the cookie module into our, into our application, add it to our package JSON, and then we, when we pr do a, a Browserify build, that will be pulled out of our node modules directory and inserted into our build. So the next step is we need to figure out how we can make a shimmed per environment module. So we're building a little module that provides a single API to the client and the server, but there's different implementations under the hood. And the solution is to use the, the package.json browser field. So there's a, a little known feature of, the, of, the, of package.json and the way it interacts with Browserify that lets you actually specify different behaviors for browser versus server. So if this is our package.json, a real bare bones package.json for our set cookie module, what we can do is we can add a browser field here. And it takes a few different forms. So if it's a string, if it's, if it's just a single file name, then it'll swap out the entire implementation for the client side. So it'll ignore all of the rest of the code in your, in your package, and when you browserify that bundle, it will use the lib client.js file instead. But you can get more fine grain too. So in this example, we've got a, an object, and so you can swap out a specific file for a different file. So if you've got like a lib node.js module in your, within your package, you can swap that out for lib client.js. And you can also swap out dependencies. So we're going to be depending on the cookie module, but let's say for whatever reason uh, the cookie module worked well on the server side, but it had a quirk or it you know, tried to do something it shouldn't, and it didn't work well in the, in the client side. Well, if there's an, an alternative module on NPM or within your node modules, you can swap out that entire module for a different one. And so with, with this, with the browser field, we can do all sorts of cool stuff, and it opens up a lot of doors on how you package up your modules for different environments. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a set cookie module. I actually already built it. Uh, you can look at the source code if you want. It's at my GitHub page. But we're going we're to step through it here. So this is the structure of our really basic set cookie module. We've got an index.js, which is like the main entry point for the, the node module. We've got a lib directory, and in our lib directory, we're going to have a setter directory. And that setter is going to, that's going to be the implementation that actually sets the cookie. And we've got one file for node and one for the, the, the browser. And so the index.js will be the node version, and the client.js will be the browser version. And then, of course, we're using cookie as a dependency, so that's going to exist in our, in our node modules directory. So this is what our index.js would look like, the entry point. At the top, we're requiring the cookie dependency, and then we're requiring setter. And you can see we're, it's a relative path, require lib setter. And so, as I'm sure you know, if you, if you require, if, if a setter is a directory and there's an index.js file inside of it, 
you can just use that semantic and it will require that. So by default, it'll use the index.js, which is a node implementation. And then all we do here, we export our public API. It's a function that takes the name, a value, and an options argument. And so because the cookie string is the same on the client and the server, right, the way that we serialize that cookie string is exactly the same. So here we can use our cookie module and say var cookie string equals cookie.serialize and pass it the name, value, and options. And then we hand it off to the setter to actually set that string. So here's what the node version looks like, lib setter index.js. So it takes that cookie string and the options, and, uh, and what it does is, so, so one thing I, I didn't mention is with a node, you can't just like set a cookie, right? You, I mean, you can't set, do anything with HTTP without the context of a specific request or response. So that's one big difference between the client and the server. And the client, it's all global, right? Like you're only ever dealing with one context, one user session. On the server side, you've got, you could have hundreds of user sessions happening at the same time on your server. And so you always have to inject through the, the request or the response. So the API for the server side, you would add a RES, a response option to the options argument. And if you don't supply that, we'll throw an error. But basically, we're just saying response.set header, set cookie in the cookie string. And then here's what the client version looks like. It's pretty complicated. It just uh, sets document.cookie. And so in our package JSON, the browser field would look like this. We're swapping out lib setter index.js for lib setter client JS. And this is exactly what SuperAgent does. So SuperAgent actually has two completely different implementations uh, for Node versus the, the browser. And just to highlight, if we look back at our entry point, our index.js, there's, there's our require. This is the require that will be affected by that package.json field. So in a nutshell, that's how to isomorph. Does this seem pretty easy so far? <laughs> that's obviously a, a kind of a trivial example. It's a rich topic with many ins and outs. And uh, I encourage you to reach out about it, and we can, we can dive into the nuts and bolts and all that. But for now, that's all I have. So I want to say thank you. And there's more resources about isomorphic JavaScript at spike.technology, which is my, my website. And um, I, it says I have five minutes, so if you have any questions, you can tweet them at me. Uh, but thanks very much.